I am Matt Marino. Uh, I am the project delivery coordinator for the Turnpike in OEM, and I'm also uh, the state cultural resources specialist. So I help manage the cultural resources compliance program with Roy Jackson in Tallahassee. Uh, and today I'm, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of our process for compliance with both state and federal cultural resources regulations. Uh, now I'm not going to focus too much on the Section 106 process itself, uh, as this is this is more applicable to the consultant CRM professionals, um, and we we do have that training available on our OEM website, and I have a link to that at the end of this presentation. Uh, but I'm going to focus more on important tasks for pd and &E project managers and some of the key differences between the state and federal processes. So I'm going to start by introducing those state and federal regulations uh, and some of their key differences. I'm going to focus on tribal coordination because that's something uh, that we have to do regardless of state or federal status. And like I said, I'm going to give a really brief overview of the actual four step section 106 process, um, which is implemented through FDOT's section 106 programmatic agreement or the, the 106 PA. And then I will finish by talking a bit about our expectations for what we want to see in environmental documents. So there is a lot of text on the next two slides, but I just want to focus on a few of the important bolded points. Uh, so this is the text from Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. So this is the federal law. And we can see that Section 106 requires federal agencies to take into account the effects of their federal undertakings on historic properties prior to the expenditure of federal funds on the undertaking. Section 106 also requires federal agencies to give the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, or the ACHP, a reasonable opportunity to comment on the undertaking and its effects. Um, but we'll pick back up with Chapter 267. So this is the, the state level regulations, and they were actually modeled after Section 106. And as a result, the processes for compliance are, are very similar. So under 267, state agencies must take in, into account the effects of their undertakings on historic properties prior to the expenditure of any state funds on the undertaking. And state agencies must afford the Florida Division of Historical Resources, or DHR, a reasonable opportunity to comment on the undertaking and its effects. So we can see that these regulations are really similar, uh, but there are a few minor differences that change the way that we consult with other agencies for state and federal projects. So like I said, our state funded only projects follow chapter 267 and our federal projects have to, have to comply with section 106. Under 267, the department consults with the Florida Department of State Division of Historical Resources or DHR. And for federal projects, we consult with the State Historic Preservation Officer or SHPO. Thankfully for us, the director of DHR also serves as the Florida SHPO. So from a project management perspective, the only difference here is the titles of the office and the recipient that we're sending our consultation documents to. Documents for state projects are addressed to the director of DHR and documents for federal projects are sent to the SHPO. And in both cases, this individual is Dr. Tim Parsons. It's currently Dr. Tim Parsons. Uh, the primary differences between the two review processes, like I said, are one, uh, the role of the ACHP, but also the role in tribal governments in consultation uh, and the involvement of OEM, and I'll get to that a bit later, and two, the specific reporting requirements uh, for state projects, which are set forth in Chapter 1A-46 of the Florida Administrative Code. So as you can see, ACHP consultation is only required for federal projects, and that's true for tribal consultation as well, uh, but I will talk more about that in a second. So just a note that a project is federalized if it requires any federal approval or permit or if it gets any federal funding. Now, even if the permit is granted for just a specific activity or location within a greater project area, the entire project is, is have to comply with Section 106. Um, and then another warning, 
federalizing a project means it has to comply with Section 4F of the US DOT Act. So the reporting requirements for the two regulations are different, but OEM has designed the FDOT procedures to ensure that our process and deliverables meet the requirements of both laws. The cultural resources compliance process, which is implemented through FDOT Section 106 PA, fulfills both the state and federal rules regarding historic properties. So chapter 267 does not explicitly require tribal coordination, but it's FDOT's policy that tribes be informed of projects that may affect a historic resource that could be of importance to them. Uh, and we want this to occur regardless of the funding source. So for state and federal projects, we are going to coordinate with tribes. And there's two main reasons for this. First off, we want to continue to build and maintain productive working relationships with our tribal partners. Uh, and we want to keep them informed of all relevant projects, not just the federal ones. And this helps with that. And second, we want to prevent significant scheduling delays should a state funded project somehow get federalized. So sites that may be important to tribes, uh, those can include historic sites that have a demonstrated association with the tribe or any archaeological site that has a pre-contact or prehistoric component. The important thing to remember here is that we cannot determine what is important to tribes, only they can. So when in doubt, it's always best to inform the tribes and to get their opinion on a site or on a project. Now, if a tribe requests government to government consultation for a federal project, you will need to inform us at OEM. Uh, we heard Jason talk about this this morning, but our day to day correspondence with tribes is what we consider coordination. But formal government to government consultation is still the responsibility of FHWA per the NEPA assignment MOU. So if you get a request from a tribe for government to government consultation, you can let me know at OEM and we will route that up to FHWA. For state funded only projects, correspondence to tribes can be sent by your office, but for federal actions, the letters are gonna be sent by OEM. In either case, I'm always available to review the letters to the tribes just to make sure that we're communicating um, the proper and relevant information in a productive and culturally sensitive way. So like I said before, I'm going to breeze through this because this, uh, the CRM professionals that, that you hire to do this work, have, they should have a solid handle on it. But I am going to stop and highlight a few key actions that, when done properly, uh, can save you a lot of time and effort. So the, the, the four steps of the Section 106 process are initiate, identify, assess, and resolve. And there's two key points to remember. First, consultation with SHPO if it's a federal project or DHR if it's a state funded only project and public involvement are both required at every step of the process. And second, the process can be concluded at any step. It just depends on the specifics of the undertaking and the resources involved. So in step one, we initiate the process by establishing the undertaking, identifying consulting parties, coordinating this with other reviews, planning to involve the public and initiating consultation with DHR. Now, if the project qualifies for ETDM screening, step one can all be done with an ETDM. Uh, if you don't have a qualifying undertaking or if it's determined that the undertaking has no potential to cause effects to historic properties, you'll record that, that finding in your project file and then you're done. There's no need to complete the other steps of the process. Um, but if necessary, if you do have an undertaking that has potential to affect historic properties, then you will proceed to step two. In step two, we determine the APE or area of potential effect. We conduct background review and field survey to identify cultural resources. And then we evaluate those resources for significance. And then again, we will consult with DHR and involve the public. Uh, most of this can also be done in ETDM if we have certain minor types of projects. Um, but most projects will still require field survey. So this, this will be completed in PD&E. 
I do want to stop and talk about APE determinations for a moment because an improperly defined APE can cause you all a lot of extra work in subsequent steps of the process. So the APE is the geographic area within which an undertaking may affect historic properties should any historic properties actually exist there. Uh, to avoid unnecessary archaeological testing, we define a separate archaeological and historic APE. Uh, and the archaeological APE is limited to areas where ground disturbance will occur, which in this example is shown in yellow. If there's no ground disturbing activities, there's no potential to affect archaeological sites, so there's really no need to spend time and effort and money uh, testing for archaeology in those areas. Uh, in this example, we have a pretty large historic APE, which is shown in red. Uh, so perhaps this project includes an elevated facility, uh, in which case the APE would have to include areas from which the elevated facility would be visible. Um, but if this project didn't include an elevated facility and the APE was just kind of haphazardly defined and it included this hypothetical 1950s era neighborhood that I've shown in the white square here, then the department is going to be responsible for identifying and describing every structure in that neighborhood for evaluating the significance of those structures and if significant for assessing the project's effects on each of those structures. So this is a better example in, uh, of a more restricted APE and it includes only the adjacent parcels to the to the backs of their property lines. So in this case, the hypothetical historic neighborhood is not included in the APE and the department is not responsible for conducting any survey in this area. The APE should be defined in consultation with SHPO or DHR. Uh, and I do strongly recommend doing this for complex projects or projects with a lot of different alternatives because if DHR sees some of our consultation documents in later project phases and they decide that the APE is not sufficient, then it's going to take a lot of time and money to go back and do additional field survey to address that problem. So once we have a properly defined APE, we can identify historic properties. This is done by first identifying cultural resources and then evaluating them for listing on the National Register of Historic Places, or NRHP. Cultural resources is an umbrella term, and it can cover anything from sites to buildings, structures, or objects, or even landscapes that are historic. And historic simply means that they are 50 years old or older. Now, if an evaluation finds that the cultural resource is significant, which means it's eligible for listing on the NRHP, then it's considered a historic property. We only need to worry about historic properties um, on, our, on our projects. We don't have to worry about project effects to cultural resources that are not considered significant. Significance is evaluated according to the National Register criteria for evaluation. A resource has to be associated with either a significant event or person, or it must embody distinctive characteristics, or it must be likely to yield important information. Uh, only one of these criteria need to apply to the resource for it to be considered significant, but it also has to possess integrity, which means that it's still able to convey the characteristics that make it significant. So if we are discussing a significant structure, but it's so old that the structure is in ruins, then it doesn't possess integrity so it would not retain its historic significance. So if we find after a field survey uh, and evaluation of significance that there are no historic properties in our APE and DHR concurs with this determination, then we're done with the process here at step two. If we do have historic properties in our APE, then we have to assess our project's effects on them. So that brings us to step three. In step three, we assess adverse effects by applying the criteria of adverse effect. And of course, we're gonna consult with DHR and involve the public. If we determine that our project will have no adverse effect to historic properties and DHR concurs with this determination, then we're done. If our project will have an adverse effect, 
then we attempt to resolve them in step four. In step four, we consult with DHR and any other consulting parties to determine and develop minimization or mitigation measures to resolve adverse effects, and we will record them in an MOA, a memorandum of agreement or other appropriate agreement document, and we will involve the public. An executed MOA evidences completion of the Section 106 or Chapter 267 compliance process, and that applies even if the stipulations of that agreement can't be completed until after construction. These stipulations should be recorded as commitments and they should be listed in the project commitment record and the commitment section of the environmental document. So as I said previously, uh, the FDOT process for compliance with all of this is implemented through the Section 106 PA. And within this PA, we have three programmatic processes that are available. Stipulation seven is the normal four-step section 106 process that we just went over. Uh, and those are gonna be for our major transportation undertakings that have the standard involvements with cultural resources. But we have two programmatic processes for projects that have only minor involvements with cultural resources. If your project qualifies for one of these processes, you can meet compliance standards through minimal background research and no or even or very little field survey. Relevant information is, is recorded on forms that are emailed to DHR and if they don't object within 30 days then your project is compliant with cultural resources regulations and you can move on. So stipulation five of the section 106 PA is for projects uh, that are minor with no potential to affect historic properties, and they have to meet the following conditions. The activity is a standalone project. The activity does not occur on tribal lands. The activity does not include and is not located in or adjacent to any historic resources. The project must be limited to activities specified in Exhibit 1, and the SHPO or FDHR has been notified of the finding of no potential to affect historic properties and they don't object within 30 days. These are our exhibit one projects and the list of one through six is actually complete. That's all of them. They are all very minor projects with no potential to affect historic properties. Um, but if your project doesn't appear on this list, then you may qualify for stipulation six. Stipulation six projects are minor projects considered unlikely to affect historic properties and they have to meet the following similar conditions. The activity is a standalone project. It doesn't occur on tribal lands. It's limited to one of the activities listed in Exhibit 1 and Exhibit 2. Uh, and the desktop analysis and field review result in the identification of no historic resources within the APE. And again, we notify DHR, and if they don't object within 30 days, then we're good to go. And you'll notice that this list of Exhibit 2 projects actually includes, um, I think, 57 total types of activities. So the, the, what you're seeing here is incomplete. These stipulations are really useful, uh, and they allow us to process a majority of our projects with minimal effort. But these conditions illustrate, again, why it's so important to properly define an APE. If we just draw a quarter mile, quarter mile uh, buffer around our project area without actually considering if our project can affect properties that far away from the project area, then we're likely gonna kick ourselves out of these minor project stipulations every time, regardless of the scope of the project. And keep in mind that, that the condition about cultural resources in your APE uh, the language is historic resources. You can't have historic resources within the APE, not historic properties. So that means just anything historic, regardless of its significance. So it's really key to define proper APEs early on. So how does this all fit in to FDOT's project development process? As I said earlier, we can complete all of step one and part of step two in ETDM for qualifying projects. Uh, this is also where we will initiate consultation with DHR and Native American tribes, 
with the hope that they can identify any red flags that, that may hold us up. We will finish the, the process in pd &E, but if there are changes in project design or even just the passage of time, uh, that may require us to reevaluate our cultural resources determinations in the right of way or design phases. So I think this is where Turnpike is going to have an advantage with this new organizational structure for project managers because I hear a lot of um, difficulties coming out of other districts where the PDE project managers will hand the project off to design PMs and they'll go through a number of design changes uh, without notifying the PDE project managers. So they get um, a last minute request to update the cultural resources documentation to account for the design changes. So I think the idea that one uh, project manager is going to stick with this project throughout PD&E and, and in later phases. I think that's going to be really beneficial for cultural resources coordination, but for also other resource issues. So during construction, we should be completing any minimization or mitigation strategies if our project does have an adverse effect. This can include archaeological monitoring of construction activities uh, or many, many other things. And some of these uh, MOA stipulations may not be completed until after construction, and that is okay too. Just another note, if a contractor wants to use a borrow pit during construction, it's their responsibility to seek DHR clearance for that activity, not ours and not turnpikes. So sort of revamping this into like a very general task list for uh, project managers during pd &E. Our consultant is going to complete a cultural resources assessment survey or CRAS, which will identify cultural resources and evaluate them for significance. And then th that document gets sent to DHR and we request their concurrence. And if they concur, we move on. If that document did identify historic properties in the APE, then we have to evaluate our project's effects to those properties in a criteria of effects report, which is also sometimes called a section 106 case study report. And that's gonna, if, that's gonna determine if our project's effects are either adverse or not adverse. And that's another document that we will send to DHR and we will request their concurrence. Of course, if the effects are adverse, then we will execute an MOA in consultation with DHR and any other consulting parties, if there are any. The cultural resources requirements for environmental documents are pretty straightforward and similar to those for other resource issues. So you'll summarize the results of consultation and resource identification efforts in the cultural section of the document, uh, including your determination, such as no historic properties affected. You're gonna discuss consultation with DHR or SHPO, uh, and you will list any commitments made to minimize or mitigate adverse effects to historic properties. CRASS's effects evaluations or other technical documents should be referenced in the environmental document but not attached. Those just live in the project file. But concurrence letters from SHPO slash DHR and any correspondence with the tribes should also be discussed in the summary and those will be attached to your environmental document. So I put together some links to supplemental resources, including the training that does dive deeper into the Section 106 process, if you want to learn more about that. Uh, I've also included links to our MOA template, which should save you some time if you do need to prepare an MOA for one of your projects. And then we also have links to our other manuals and handbooks, uh, as well as the DHR's Manual for Cultural Resources Practitioners. Uh, and the Section 106 PA.